Uh, on behalf of the McLean Center for Clinical Medical Ethics, I'm pleased to welcome you to today's lecture in our series on ethical issues in healthcare reform. Uh, today's talk is the eighth in this year's series of 28 noon lectures uh, on that topic. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome and introduce uh, today's speaker, uh, Ralph Muller. Ralph is the CEO of the University of Pennsylvania Health System, um, a $3 billion enterprise that includes five hospitals, a faculty practice plan, a primary care provider network, home care, hospice care, and long-term care. Uh, Ralph is the director of the National Committee for Quality Assurance uh, of the Joint Commission and is a commissioner uh, on accreditation. Ralph Muller received his bachelor's degree in economics from Syracuse University and a master's degree in government from Harvard. Uh, after graduation, he served in leadership positions in the Massachusetts state government. Uh, I believe, Ralph, running the health department? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, and then as a uh, uh, he, in, in that role, he was responsible for Massachusetts Medicaid program. It was right around that time um, that Ralph was recruited by Hannah Gray to come to the University of Chicago as bu budget director uh, for the university. Ralph's career in academic medicine uh, began a few years later uh, when he crossed Ellis Avenue and became the vice president of the University of Chicago Hospital and then Deputy Dean of Biological Sciences. Uh, for the next 15 years, that is from about 1986 uh, to 2001, uh, Ralph served as president and CEO of the University of Chicago Hospitals and Health System. Ralph has been a visiting fellow at King's Fund, a healthcare foundation in London where he conducted a comparative study of American and British health systems. Uh, Ralph has also served as chairman of the AAMC and as chairman of the University Health Systems Consortium. Uh, today, Ralph Muller will speak to us on the impact of health reform on academic medical centers. Please join me in giving Ralph a warm welcome. Well, it's a pleasure to be back. I haven't been in this room in uh, 12 years. I remember uh, the 16, 17 years I was part of what you now call uh, University of Chicago Medicine. We had many, many meetings here. It was kind of fun uh, to walk the hallways this morning. I had a chance to see a new hospital. But uh, kind of, some people hadn't seen me in a while. I haven't seen in a while. It has been uh, 10, 12 years since I've been here. So <laughs> it must be some of our faculty travel. I just think I was traveling a lot over the course of the last 12 years. But it. it it's a delight uh, to be back. What I want to do today is talk uh, basically what's ha happening to academic medicine. Uh, I'll use Penn as an example, but really talk about it more nationally. Hopefully some of these things will be relevant uh, to Chicago as, as, as well. And as you know, I, as, as Mark pointed out, uh, once upon a time I was trained as a quantitative social scientist, and part of what I learned uh, in that time is you know, with 50 states and many cities, you have a lot of cultures around the country. So it's not really one style of healthcare inside this country. It really varies uh, as to what happens inside any environment. And while when I went to, to Penn, I felt uh, my first day there, I, I, I recognized uh, what uh, kind of place it was based on the many years I'd spent in Chicago. You also have to learn what, uh, what's different about any environment. So what happens in, in California, what happens in Massachusetts versus other parts of the country, you always have to decide what, what, what is distinctive about an environment uh, that can only be done there. What can you do that can be replicated uh, elsewhere? And hopefully I can draw some of those points out uh, for you uh, uh, today. But as you'll see uh, from what I'm saying, there's not one size fits all. The country is not moving to one kind of healthcare system. And obviously, uh, like many of you, I'm sure inside this audience, uh, as supporters of, of President Obama, the last uh, six weeks or so have been pretty uh, rough uh, for him in terms of the rollout of the healthcare site. Uh, but I'll talk a little bit about uh, that as, as well in terms of where uh, we are, uh, where we're going. Uh, so, so I'm going to talk about today is a kind of summary of health reform, 
talk about what we in academic medicine, University of Chicago, Penn, other places like us can, uh, can do, and where society values us. And then what we as health centers and medical centers can perhaps do as a result of what's happening in, in health reform. Again, you've had other speakers before me, so I'll just go over this briefly. Yeah, uh, uh, even with the kind of confusion and difficulty of the website, we have to remember why Obamacare, as even the president uh, calls it, so, so probably he, he wonders why he called it that, uh, what the intention was. First and foremost, as the title of the act, uh, the Affordable Care Act says, it's to provide insurance for people who are currently not insured. Now, when they first passed the bill, they thought up to 32 million people might be insured, roughly 16 million people by expanding Medicaid, and 16 million people uh, who basically uh, who are in the working population. After the Supreme Court decision roughly a year and a half ago, which gave states the option as to whether they want to expand Medicaid or not, that number, that, that number of 32 million, which was the aspiration back and when the, the bill was passed uh, three and a half years ago, is probably the highest they'll get now is 24 million. And obviously, given the difficulty of the exchanges, which I'll talk about in a, in a bit, then the number may not uh, be that high. It also, as the president said, it intended uh, to improve healthcare quality. It wasn't just to bring more people into insurance. And I'll speak a bit about some of the value propositions that we in other places can meet. And it also tried to pay for itself in part. Uh, and uh, hospitals such as the University of Chicago and Penn and many hospitals around the country, uh, insurance plans all kind of you know, gave it the ch church and took some reduced payments as a way of, of paying for it. And so for example, how did it hit hospitals? Uh, they, as, you, as many of you inside the room knows, we get paid annual updates from uh, Medicare and teaching hospitals get even more money than community hospitals. And they reduce those uh, uh, updates. Uh, they did much more measurement of quality. All of you are probably very familiar now with the core measures uh, from the Medicare agency, which is called CMS. A big focus on bringing down mortality, a big focus on bringing down infection rates inside of hospitals, and uh, something that we're all familiar with, whether it's Chicago or Philadelphia or uh, anywhere, you know, about 17 to 20 percent of the Medicare population gets readmitted within 30 days. And so they put in uh, penalties on readmission. As we also know, sitting in Chicago, the south side, and where I sit in Philadelphia right now, a lot of the reasons that people get readmitted to hospitals have nothing to do with the hospital, have to do with the kind of social economic conditions that people live in. And obviously, those of us who are urban centers very much feel being held accountable for what happens 30 days after hospitalization may not always be under our, our control. And there are also kind of incentives and rewards inside uh, the Affordable Care Act, uh, such as having uh, payment, quality payments linked to performance um, outcomes. Again. Uh, how was it paid for? It's roughly almost a uh, trillion dollar bill. Uh, but as you can see from the pie chart here, roughly 40% of it came from those kind of cuts I mentioned to both hospitals and to Medicare uh, plans. There was a tax on higher income uh, people that produced about 20% of the potential savings. And then some of the things you've heard about, such as taxes on device manufacturers and taxes on so-called Catholic health plans were also ways in which they paid for it. To the extent to which this is exactly how it plays out over the course of the next five, six years is still to be seen. But the intent was to pay for the health care uh, plan through these various mechanisms. And as part of the effort uh, that you've seen the House of Representatives over 40 times now vote to repeal Obamacare, one of the challenges they have, if they are sincere about deficit cutting, if you repeal Obamacare, you're going to increase the deficit. So we'll see how sincere they are really about that as well. So what do we do? What do places like Chicago and, and Penn do? As you know, you have a Center for Advanced Medicine. You have a Center for Cure and Discovery. Basically, we're our point of differences. And part of what you learn from people from business schools and people who teach marketing and uh, in, in corporations and so forth, what's your point of difference? What do you as an academic center do that other places can't do? And part of what I was proud of when I worked with all of you here in the uh, 80s and 90s is uh, thinking through what led to the Dutchess Swiss Center for Advanced Medicine and thinking how, you know, I see Dr. Volks here, or what it took to build up uh, cancer programs and heart failure programs and take care of premature in infants. So basically, what places like us do, whether Chicago or Penn, our counterparts in Boston and San Francisco, our basic, the thing that society most values us for is to do those highly complex procedures and interventions that nobody else can do. Doesn't mean that's all we do, but that's what they, uh, we get paid for. So when, when Medicare gives extra payments to teaching hospitals, it's for this. When Blue Cross gives you better rates than they give a community hospital, it's for this. 
So I think one of the challenges we've always had is obviously all hospitals, including Chicago and Pence and others, do a lot more than just this. They serve the community as well. But our differential role is, usually, is around complex care. And we always have to remember to constantly be innovating, constantly be discovering. Otherwise, we will not be rewarded by society for being, as we say here, at the forefront of medicine. Obviously, you also have, we have a major role in research and translational research. Uh, you've done your re translational re uh, research investments over the last number of years. The NIH has moved much more in the direction of uh, funding translational research than they did years ago. There's some controversy inside the field where they've gone too far, but certainly that's what Congress and society, again, part of my job, and Dr. Polanski's here as, as, as well, part of what our job is is constantly interpreting those signals you get from society and figuring out what we as an institution do. And one of the things they want us to do is constantly translate those discoveries that come from the science into care delivery. They also want us to change the way in which we do care. The, the DCAM was an effort to say, we're first going to build outpatient practices. You know, for 30, 40 years now, care has moved increasingly from the inpatient to the outpatient uh, setting. Part of what we had to do when we built DCAM now 17 years ago, uh, and what we've done it as Penn as, as well, is to have new settings in which to deliver care. But in beyond just having a building, it's the new models of care. I remember when I first became president of the hospital in 1985, and some of the oncologists uh, seeing here in the audience knows, we used to have a lot of our beds filled with patients uh, who required, uh, who were receiving chemotherapy. They came to the hospital for six to 10 days. That doesn't happen at all anymore. So almost all of us have these big infusion suites inside. We have, a, we have a CAM at Penn, you have a CAM here. And those kind of things have changed uh, considerably. You know, a lot of the procedures that are now being done on outpatient basis in your cath labs and your EP labs, those things were done uh, uh, with p people as inpatients years ago. So that, that ongoing innovation comes from settings such as ours. And one of the things we've had to do, uh, and it's somewhat supported by the, the federal government, is to think about how one uses information uh, technology to better uh, advance care coordination. Now, one uh, you all are familiar with, just before the Stimulus Act uh, 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 that the president uh, had passed when he first came uh, in, there was also an act called the High Tech Act, which is basically the money that all of you uh, received uh, to advance the uh, proliferation and diffusion of EHRs, electronic health records around the country. Uh, part of the aspiration there was if we were connected uh, uh, through electronic records, we'd be much a more able to coordinate care. Now, as we know, information technology by itself does not change uh, the patterns of care. We as people have to change the patterns of care. But I remember in the old days, uh, you know, the old paper records we had down in the basement here of, of building this, uh, a hospital, and now obviously you, you, you do it all electronically. So part of where academic centers are really taking the lead is that kind of investment in, in changing care patterns. So um, what are we being faced right now with the Affordable Care Act? First of all, you hear this language all the time. You know, the fee-for-service system, which is essentially how most of us get paid for care outside places in California and some parts of the upper Midwest. Uh, is uh, the jargon around that is it's a volume-based system and they want to go to value-based. Essentially what that means right now, doctors and hospitals inc are, are paid and have been for the last 20, 30 years where they do more in some sense they get more. And they're trying to change that to what's the outcome? What are you, what are you trying to get uh, for, for the payments? And you see experiments that we'll talk about in a moment in the Affordable Care Act like ACOs and bundled payments that try to achieve that. They want us to be more efficient, and they do that in part by just cutting off payments. So one of the ways you learn how to live on less is they pay you less, you have to learn how to live less. So there are payment cuts inside the Affordable Care. You also see, uh, and you, uh, you see this in Chicago, and I saw you made an announcement this week about some affiliation you're doing in, in, in North, uh, northern Indiana and other places uh, beyond. Around the country, there's a lot of consolidation going on. Hospitals consolidating, uh, physician group movement, and we can talk about that later, is not moving as quickly as what's happening in hospitals. The insurance companies really have consolidated the last 10, 15 years. So part of this goes back to classic economic theory of if one side of the transaction is bigger, you have to be bigger, kind of theories of countervailing power. And more and more you see that around the country. Unfortunately, the evidence that that either reduces care, or increases quality or reduces costs is not there. So these basically are classic economic moves to get more market power, get higher prices. So as we know, we have an American healthcare system, and we're part of it, you know, both Chicago and Penn. It gets pretty high prices. It has increasingly a big part of the share of the economy, which causes citizens and politicians to get worried about how much money we're getting. Unfortunately, a lot of this consolidation has not yet led 
to better care or lower costs. Now I think uh, I'm going to come back to that. That's a big challenge for us because just getting bigger does not mean you get better. Uh, but it certainly gives you market power and that's one of the concerns government obviously has. We are uh, uh, you know, obviously a, a place that, like all the great academic places in the country, again whether in the East Coast or West Coast, Chicago and so forth, how to integrate the patient care mission, the research mission, the teaching mission. And again, when you think about the differential advantage we have, it's the integration of those things that really other hospitals can't replicate. So we always have to hold on to that as one of the points of real difference that uh, we make. And another uh, theme that's increasingly being voiced is are we going to be responsible for patient populations? And I'm going to speak about that more fully, but I'm much more skeptical that most of the American system knows really how to manage patient populations. So Penn, as Mark said in his introduction, we have five hospitals, uh, we have a lot of physician groups, uh, we have a lot of post-acute uh, uh, care, such as a rehab hospital, a long-term care hospital, inpatient hospice, a big home care company, nursing homes, and, and so forth. We do not have an insurance plan. We do not own an insurance plan. And one of the things when people keep saying they want what happened to Kaiser or Henry Ford or Geisinger to be a model for the rest of the country, all those places are built around group practices, which academic medicine is not, and they're built around insurance plans. So whenever you try to take the Kaiser model and drive it nationally, you have to remember you have to have an insurance plan in it, and you have to have a group practice in it. And if you don't have that, you can't replicate it. And I'm always amazed the extent to which people think they can kind of Kaiserize the nation without having those prerequisites uh, there. And therefore, you have to think what a Chicago pen can do, absent being a true group practice and absent having an insurance product. That's a very substantial difference. And whenever you see people making these national comparis comparisons, when you don't have an insurance plan as part of what you should do, and I would argue it's not necessary for us to have an insurance plan. But if you have one like Kaiser and Henry Ford do, you can do different things. Uh, than when you're just a hospital. And the reason for that is fairly obvious uh, because if you run an insurance plan, then if you reduce hospital utilization or do a better job of reducing your readmissions, then you, uh, by reducing hospital utilization, you make more money as an insurance company. Basically, hospitals are in the bed filling business, it's as blunt as that. Insurance companies are in the bed emptying business. And so whenever you try to get those two companies in the same place, you get very schizophrenic and you get a lot of clashes. And if you watch what's going on in Pittsburgh right now, this big war going on between Highmark, which is the Blue Cross product in, uh, in Western Pennsylvania, and University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, where they basically at war with each other, uh, because, uh, they, uh, because they both run both insurance plans and, and hospitals. And I think that kind of schizophrenic behavior leads them to do very disruptive things. Again, these are the missions that we have, such as yours. Uh, Penn is a little bigger than, uh, than Chicago, as we can see here, we're roughly a uh, bit over four billion, uh, but you know, big, big uh, residency programs, over a thousand uh, residents and fellows, 2,000 faculty, second or third biggest in NIH. So, and we do also, like you, a lot of primary care in the surrounding areas. Now, our market, and as I mentioned at the start of my conversation with you, um, you have to really look how your market changes. So one of the, when I was in Chicago, you know, with, uh, and it's still true here, you have University of Chicago, you have Northwestern, you have Rush, you have U of I, Loyola has kind of drifted into a more major uh, Catholic uh, system. But you have five academic centers competing, four big insurers. It's a different kind of market than if you have a place in which uh, there's 10 insurers or one insurer. If you have one insurer like you do in Iowa or Alabama, you better get along with that insurer, or otherwise you're, you're out of business. So the University of Alabama and the University of Iowa have to figure out how to get along with that. If you're in a market that has four or five insurers, you can try to hold yourself out as a differential player vis-a-vis -vis those insurers. But you have to be attentive to what the insurance market looks like uh, you know, as the leadership of the, the medical center here uh, uh, thinks about that. We are still, as you kind of go from west coast to east coast, uh, as I say, the Philly is the land of cheesesteaks and uh, California is the land of tofu. So uh, <laughs> it has an effect on your patient. So the hospitalization rates in Philadelphia are two to three times what they are in Southern California or Portland, Oregon, because there's different lifestyles out there, different medical practices. So Phil, the whole corridor from Boston to kind of Baltimore is very high utilization. Um, so when you have high medical utilization, it changes how you run a system. We have California, which is very primary care driven and with these big uh, uh, primary care groups and Kaiser, you have a whole different kind of a system than you have in Chicago or, or Philadelphia. So you have to look at what your local environment is. We are still an environment in Philadelphia 
where there are not large primary care practices. Insofar as there's any kind of bundle, uh, aggregation of primary care, it's around the medical centers. There are really no big primary care groups. Um, so essentially, we get all our patients from referrals from private physicians around the metropolitan area. So we, like Chicago, have to be very attentive to those referral relationships. Those patients are not driven by an insurance product like they are inside Kaiser. They're not dri driven by, by a big primary care group. So it's a high utilization area, high cost area. Now, inpatient activity has gone down. Now, Dr. Polanski told me inpatient activity at Chicago is, is going up, at least for the UFC. But uh, the main reason it's going down in uh, Philadelphia and beyond is, this is probably too technical for most of you, but the, the so-called observation days are now turning one to two day hospital stays into outpatient stays. But uh, hospital utilization in, in uh, Pennsylvania is going down. Now, when you start with very high utilization to begin with, there's opportunities to bring it down in Philadelphia that there are in California or in Minnesota. So that's one of the things one has to be very attentive to in terms of understanding uh, your, your market. There's a simple geography. We're all over the place. Uh, we have more geographic distribution than uh, we, we had here at, uh, at, at, uh, at Chicago uh, with more hospitals. One of the things that uh, Dr. Polanski and I discussed briefly this morning that I learned from my Chicago days is to put multi-specialty centers in geographic dispersed areas from the hospital. Uh, we, we, we located them 5, 10, 15, 20 miles away from our hospital where we aggregate like 10 primary care physicians with oncologists and cardiologists and orthopods. And that's a way of keeping a patient population tied to you uh, by having those multi So they're like mini DCAMs. Uh, you kind of cluster them around the area. And I, I know uh, you're thinking about that here too. I think it's a very valuable way of keeping a patient population tied to you who will come downtown to Chicago or Penn for the kind of advanced care that you can do inside this kind of setting. But when patients need uh, ongoing chemotherapy, ongoing radiotherapy, and so forth, uh, or follow-up visits with their orthopods, having those distributed sites is a very good thing to do. And we've done that in many areas around uh, Philadelphia. One thing I learned here at Chicago uh, is uh, half the people in the country go to the closest hospital. Just like they go to the local church, the local supermarket, the local elementary school. And you have to have a set of programs that causes people to say, when I'm not going to the local hospital, why do I go to Chicago? Why do I go to Penn? You also, they, they go to you, because I mentioned earlier, because you have complex programs that only can be treated at Chicago or Northwestern, a Rush, a Penn, a, a Mass General, and so forth. So what you see is that uh, the further away the patients come, uh, it's really a measure of the fact that they're coming to bypass a local hospital and come to you. So you have to give them a reason to bypass a local hospital and come to you, and that means it has to be a differentiated program. Now, fortunately, at uh, the current moment, the way we get paid, uh, given by Medicare and Blue Cross, is we get paid more for complex disease than we do for simple disease. So the kind of money we make also uh, uh, is a very much a function of people bypassing the local hospital. So uh, some of this also function in the American system. You know, in some ways, geography is destiny in terms of how you get paid, because people who live in more affluent areas have better insurance than people who live in less affluent areas. This is not hard to figure out. It's part of what Obamacare is trying to remedy. Uh, but uh, we've all learned you have to have a, a regional reach uh, to be able to uh, make, uh, uh, bring, make the ends meet. Now, 10 years ago, as you thought about integrated care, it was basically hospitals and special care and building a DCAM. And then as that evolved, adding other programs such as we've evolved at, at Penn. And the question is, what's going to happen in the next couple of years? Um, is there going to be any kind of integration of insurance plans and providers like us? Are there going to, ACO is going to take off or not? Will we have more focus on chronic care management? Be more information technology connectivity? Will there be different payment models in fee for service? And the aspiration of many people, uh, largely associated with the kind of policy crowd that drove the Affordable Care Act, is will we move more and more to population health, which is really the kind of you know, California model. So. What do we do? What's the challenge to us? First of all, as I've noted, whether it's Chicago or Penn, our core competency, what we do best, is this high value complex care. We have expensive costs. It's, first of all, doing complex care is expensive. Secondly, an academic mission is supported by this. And all of us, whether it's Chicago or Harvard or Michigan or Duke or Penn, has to support the infrastructure of academic medicine. As we all know, research in an accounting sense, research doesn't pay for itself. In an accounting sense, education doesn't pay for itself. So you have to have big margins in the clinical 
programs to cross subsidize that. And that's true of any medical center, uh, big medical center inside the country. In some sense, the more research you do, the more clinical program you need to support. That's a simple truism that Dr. Polanski and others know well. Dr. Rubenstein knew it when he was at, at Penn. I know it. And the question is, how do you, how do, you do that? And most of our patients, 80% of our patients at Penn, come from somebody else's practice. So we do not own the front end of the practice or the back end of the practice when they get referred back to the local hospital. They come 60, 70 miles away. So how one does, quote unquote, population health when that patient is being seen elsewhere by primary care physicians and specialists, sees our doctors, and then goes back to them, is hard for me to imagine exactly how you do that when you're just basically in the middle of that transaction. We're not, and for us to, do, to own all the primary care uh, which Penn tried to do in the 90s and almost took the university down because they lost $800 million doing this, which is a big number even then um, and now, uh, is you cannot establish a primary care practice that covers the whole metropolitan area in the sense that you know, Kaiser and Billings Clinic and Marshall Clinic have tried to do. But that will not work for academic medicine almost anywhere inside uh, the country. So how do you take more responsibility for a population? And I'm going to give you my suggestions. If you're not the front end of primary care, and you're not the place where the patients go back to. Our patients, like yours, come from 80 miles around. They do not all live here. So the question is how to take care of that population. And so we get, as I say, we get signals all the time from society. By society, I mean the government, Blue Cross, employers, patients. And they obviously want a healthcare system that is changed. But it's like the people who uh, say uh, they don't like Congress, but they like their congressmen. Everybody thinks the healthcare system be changed, but they don't want anything changes that affects them. Uh, so exactly what it means that everybody wants to have more population health is kind of uh, interesting for me to consider. So what should we do? Well, at a very simple level, getting your quality up and your cost down is a good strategy no matter what you're doing. <laughs> you, you'll win no matter what happens if you do that. This is not very profound, but uh, 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 the efforts at reducing infections, reducing uh, preventable mortality, and doing all the kind of uh, quality uh, improvement efforts that I know you're committed to will win in the long term. And patients want that. Patients, society demands it. And getting your costs under control. Now, Chicago and Penn are never going to get their costs down to a community hospital level. But you have to constantly keep figuring out how to get efficiency. You know, one of the, those of us who run hospitals know uh, just like uh, all of us who ride airplanes these days, the way you run a hospital at high efficiency is to run it at 90%. So whenever you run any part of your hospital at 60%, whether it's your ORs or your cath labs or your rooms at 60%, you're going to lose money. The airlines figured this out too. Now, running a hospital at 90% rather than 60% causes a lot of issues, just like those of us who ride airplanes these days. A lot of issues when the, the, every plane you go on right now, is, every seat is jammed compared to the old good old days when you could have 50% of the people on it. But as I remember, as Mark said, I, I used to be the chair of the WMC and had to go down to Washington every week from Chicago uh, to do advocacy. Luckily, this was pre-9-11. And I remember those days, it cost 1,200 bucks round trip to fly to, to, from Chicago to, uh, to DC. Uh, right after deregulation, it went down to 172. I remember that number. I always said to myself, and uh, John Mabies here has been a long time board of trustee member, I said, if I had to do the hospital from going from 1,200 bucks to 172, <laughs> I would not do it. So, uh, so the, but the, the point is here, you have to figure out how to run these things at lower cost. So maybe what part of the support I can give to the administration here, just as an outsider who is once here, these cost reduction efforts, you just have to keep focusing on them. And, but you don't do it. You don't do it. It comes from kind of performance improvement. Whether you use Toyota methods or lean methods or perf uh, performance improvement from uh, elsewhere, you have to have some kind of methodology uh, for really efficiency reduction. And at the, at the core, the doctors and nurses have to lead that uh, because they know best how to change the front line of healthcare. So in many ways, that kind of efficiency is paramount for all of us to figure out. And those of us who figure out better will do well because sooner or later, as having hung, ar hung around U University of Chicago economists a long time in my 20-some uh, years here, the marketplace will find the more f efficient providers. You can't hide your inefficient programs. So having a, a constant thrust towards cost efficiency is of, of critical importance. I've said you need to create partnerships and linkages with other providers. You know, part of what we've done at, at Penn, and I, uh, and I know you're doing some of it here. I remember when I was here in the 90s, I would have loved if we could have go run a, uh, 
a cardiac unit elsewhere or an oncology unit elsewhere, another hospital. And in those days, hospitals weren't willing to let a University of Chicago or Northwest, Northwestern come in in one of those units. Now they're more willing to do that, to get that kind of expertise. And I know you're considering some of that with some of your affiliates here. But you don't want to own a lot of other hospitals, but you want to make sure you have programs elsewhere where the expertise of your doctors and nurses can be shared with the local population. So thinking out ways to geographically disperse yourself by being part of other hospitals or having freestanding centers, I think it's a good way to think about that. Now, I wouldn't go around owning a lot of hospitals, but you know, here and there, pick out a cancer unit in a population that can't be served, pick out a, a neonatal unit, pick out heart, and you have to respond to opportunities. And obviously, you know, I think it's a very wise move for you to go to Indiana, because Indiana is a natural place, as we always learn, you have to go past the University of Chicago before you go to Russia Northwestern, so Indiana is a good place for you guys to go. <laughs> I learned very early when I, uh, some of you remember Jeff Goldsmith. I know I, I see Ann Dudley uh, Goldblatt here. One of the things that Jeff Goldsmith, he, and he, he worked with John maybe as well, one of the things he did, uh, he was here in the early 80s uh, as I was coming uh, to my role, and uh, he put me up in the helicopter before it became famous in ER. So we, we basically uh, uh, flew over the whole metropolitan area to look at travel routes. And one of the things uh, you learn, you have to look at the travel routes that get you to Chicago and which are the, the ones that get you more, most conveniently. Locate your practices there, locate your affiliations where people can come most uh, uh, conveniently um, uh, to you. And I think you have to target patient populations that can benefit from the kind of stuff that Chicago and Penn does well. I'll give you some. So what kind of things sh should you try out? And I think in many ways, you have a couple of years to do this. The, 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 uh, as, as the implementation of Obamacare has shown, or it's not so good, well implementation so far, nothing changes in healthcare that, that quickly. So the kind of lower risk things you can do is more service line structures. And one of our intents when we built DCAM was just try physical co-location, neurology with neurosurgery, orthopedics with rheumatology, and cardiology with cardiac surgery. Try physical co-location as a way of trying to move towards programmatic integration. But I think you have to extend that now and really have service lines across the hospitals so that, you know, for example, we've done at Penn, we have cardiology and imaging and cardiac surgery and pathology all working as, and, and, and with rehab medicine, all working as part of one unit. So we've gone big time towards service lines. The art of this, for those of you who are the academic chairs here, is you have to both continue to honor the traditional academic structure and also figure out how to blur the service, have service lines across those lines. It's very challenging to do. But my advice is that's one of the ways in which we can stand out. And it causes you to start thinking about populations in, in ways that, again, the government and the Blue Cross employers and patients want you to think about them. They don't want to have to be the people who navigate across your surgeons and your radiologists and your pathologists and your internists and your cardiologists. They want you to figure it out. So I would say that's a low risk way. It's not hard, easy to do, but it's a low risk way of, 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 of doing that. You can read. Um, Something, I mean, I, I'm not going to read all my slides uh, 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 to you, but you know, in, you know, the next couple of years is going to be much more what's called bundling. And in some ways, for those of you who have been around a while as I have, DRGs, which we've had since 1983, are a form of bundling. Because prior to 1983, the hospital had kind of fee for service every element. And since from 83 on, they basically said, you get so much for a hip replacement, you get so much for a cardiac uh, uh, transplant, you get so much uh, for chemotherapy. That's a bundle. Now what they're going to start doing is extending that in time. We are held accountable, I'd say, for a week after the hospitalization, a month after the hospitalization. So basically, as physicians and nurses, you're held accountable for not just the hospitalization itself, but what happens after the hospitalization. You can also see being moved forward in time, where you're, where you're assigned, let's say, and one of the things we're experimenting, experimenting with right now is heart attacks, and basically looking at populations who are at high risk of heart attacks and managing the heart attack and then managing them after. We've written about this in the New England Journal last week and we call it automated hovering, where you basically hover over patients, high risk populations as a way of trying to manage their care, both before hospitalization and afterwards. I recommend you keep experimenting with that as, as, as well. And the bigger higher risk things is, you know, as we know, the physicians have not aggregated inside this country as much as people have been trying to aggregate them for 30, 40 years. You know, we've had Kaiser at it for 70 years, the Mayo for over 100 years, Cleveland Clinic for 80 years, and so forth. Fewer than 10% of the nation's physicians, fewer than 10% of the nation's physicians are organized in groups of more than 100. And that includes all the places like UFC and Penn that has 1,000 physicians under, under our roof. So most two-thirds of American doctors 
are still in groups of less than 10. It's still a cottage industry. So the notion that you're going to have big population management when most of the doctors are 2s, 3s, 4s, and 6s, they're not us. They're not Mayo and so forth. Is something that I think is much harder. And, and, and teaching physicians how to share risk when they're three, four person groups, it's one thing to do if you're a 100 person group. But I think for most American populations, this is not happening anytime uh, soon. So, what we've done inside the fee for service structure, you know, we've done the service line integration that I, that I pointed out. Keep, uh, we've made a massive investment in big data and having real time inf information. So, any one of our nurses, any one of our clinicians can now, on any unit, you know, uh, look, look exactly in real time. They can go to a cardiac unit or a cancer unit, inpatient, outpatient, immediately log on. What are my quality metrics for last month compared to last year? What are they today? Uh, what are they by program? What are they by doctor? What are they by patient? So you can just, almost the way you can check your Amazon account or your Vanguard account, you can now check everything and manage your population that way. That we made a big investment in that, and we think having that kind of real-time information there available uh, to, uh, to doctors makes a difference. It has to be real-time, just like all of you know, you would not cross the street based on looking at a Google map, right? Because a Google map might have been, you don't manage care based on information that's a year old. So you have to have real-time information uh, to do that. And obviously, like all of us, we made major investments in IT as well. Um, we are like other places. We're doing a lot of experimentation. Uh, so we have these, uh, our big plan is Blue Cross. And I, on joint cardiac procedures now, we're having a shared savings model. Whereas we, as you know, in the fee-for-service system right now, Every time we reduce a readmission, because we do a better job of following the patient afterwards to make sure they see the doctor, take their meds, uh, deal with the activities of daily living. Every time we reduce a readmission, in a sense, you know, when people get readmitted, the hospital gets paid for it. So when we reduce a readmission, that's a savings to the insurance company, not to us. So, but obviously you want to have doctors and hospitals incentivized to reduce the readmissions rather than having them come back. But you have to have plans in which there's a shared savings around that as, as well. In terms of population management, my, my feeling is places like us, as I mentioned earlier, where 80% of our patients are referred from outside, we're better off taking certain populations, and I'll talk about them, like congestive heart failure, heart disease, strokes, breast cancer, and learning how to manage those populations. What I'm discussing with Blue Cross right now is say, look, give us all your prostate cancer business in the, in the Philadelphia area, or breast cancer. So let's say in breast cancer, we now are able to do genetic analysis that indicates which women will, re which women will respond well to chemo, hormone therapy, and which will not. So if you give us 100 patients, we'll sort out the 50 that will respond, and the other 50, they don't get the chemotherapy, the patient's better off, you save money. So let us sort it out. And it's much, you're much better off having Penn with our brand name, just like in Chicago with your brand name, having Penn do that screening around genetic and other kind of diagnostic skills rather than having, quote unquote, the insurance company do it and, and having all that kind of you know, Harry and Louise stuff in the 90s about the insurance company denying care. But if you can do better diagnostic uh, in, interventions on a population at risk and then share the savings, and so both the patient and the insurer and the employer is better off, we think that's a model for real success. So that's the one we're working with them on right now. Take those populations where our diagnostic skill is superior. And as you know, the doctors and audience know, you can't claim this for everything we do. So you have to pick the spots in which we really are better than the community hospital and say, assign that population to us. And as we kind of sort out the right interventions, uh, then you have a better chance of a better outcome and, and cost savings. So what kind of models do you have? These are, this is kind of work that AMC has, has been doing. Some of this really goes back to efforts in the 90s as, as well. And uh, again, my sense is, we, a place like Chicago and Penn should be kind of in the middle of the spot, the kind of yellow bar uh, in the middle, uh, where uh, you uh, try to manage certain kind of uh, populations where you really feel that uh, where the patients and the and employers and insurers feel they have to come to Chicago or Penn uh, for their kind of outcome. I'm much more skeptical uh, about trying to dominate a whole region. And I think examples where people take a Billings Clinic in the middle of Montana or Geisinger in the middle of northern uh, Pennsylvania, there's nobody around. And those populations have two, 300,000 people. You can be the only provider there, but that's not a model for a place like Philadelphia or Chicago or New York. There's not going to be anybody who's going to be the, 
the provider of all primary care and the insurer of that. So those kind of plans, population health manager, makes sense only about five, 10 spots in the country where basically there are no people and no other competitors, which is not the reality for most parts of the country that are urban and, and very congested. And as I said to you, you can kind of segment your population. Now, the Obamacare is trying to get the healthy people into the population. I, our comparative expertise in taking care of healthy people is minimal. Community hospitals can do that. If I always said, you can deliver a baby in a, in a taxi cab, you can deliver in a community hospital. Uh, they, don't, they get insulted when I say that, but uh, basically, the healthy people are not our, compar our comparative excellence. I've, I've spoken to, on the complex at the bottom here, cancer, strokes, transplants. Those are high expense cases. As we know from many studies, 5% of the population, 5%, 50% of the cost of American health care is in 5% of the population. We should focus on how to get that 5% better managed through our diagnostic and therapeutic outcomes. And the savings you have there, largely by also reducing clinical variation. The IOM Institute of Medicine just came out of a study two months ago that looked at geographic variation. You may, for those of you who are kind of policy wonks in the audience know, there's been a big controversy going on the last few years. You know, why is Miami so high utilization uh, versus you know, Minnesota is the kind of paragon? And Dr. Gowani from Harvard wrote about the New York a few years ago when he compared two, two sections in, um, in, in Texas uh, in terms of hospital utilization. So there's this big controversy that was put into the Affordable Care Act. Should we take the money from high utilizers like Philadelphia and Chicago and Miami and move the money to Minnesota? So the IOM was, commi uh, was commissioned to do a study of this, and they found out that utilization is not that geographic. It's within geography. It's, it's enormous variation inside Chicago, enormous variation inside Philadelphia, enormous variation inside our hospital, enormous variation in our practice. So I, when we look at our cardiac surgeons and our vascular surgeons and our orthopods, they vary, same patient, they vary in what they do. So we're really focusing, how do you bring that variation down? And try to make sure that you bring the variation down, bring costs down, get better outcomes. So that kind of focus on bringing variation down, again, it's a special place in which I think we can uh, uh, have a comparative advantage. Uh, and I've mentioned as well, uh, you know, when you have the onset of chronic disease, I think the special niche that we have is what I call the acute expression of chronic disease. Chronic disease is obviously, especially with uh, obesity, is, is kind of expanding inside uh, America. And I think where we have a relative advantage is figuring out when, that, when they need that acute intervention, how to manage that a lot better, and do the kind of things that prevent that from uh, becoming an acute expression of chronic disease. That's a comparative advantage that I, I would have. And I think we can do that in the current pay, payment model as, as well. So just a quick aside, obviously the last six weeks, uh, if you watch the morning news, have been a bit of fiasco for the healthcare exchanges. It opened uh, on October 1st. The number of people signed up have been very modest uh, uh, from the start. You know, they clearly are very apologetic about what uh, they did. Now, as they point out, um, they knew some parts of this weren't going to work. In the, in the atmosphere where there was not a single Republican vote for Obamacare, they had no room to kind of go to, back to Congress and say, there's certain parts that are broken, we need to fix it. There's no, no opportunity to fix it. That being said, they totally misunderstood what a big uh, uh, experiment, experiment this was. As you know, from running information systems inside your hospital, you don't start with a big bang, putting an information system in a, a, a whole place at once. At Penn, where we start our IT implementations, at a smaller hospital, a smaller wing, kind of roll up. And I was with uh, one of the speakers who's speaking here uh, in two months, Nancy Ann DePaul, who's the health star under Obama. Uh, I was with her yesterday. I said, why didn't you just start in North Dakota? It was like 10 people. You know, uh, <laughs> and then move to Kansas before you ever try coming to Pennsylvania. Uh, uh, so you know, the whole notion that you learn from systems implementation, start small, learn, tweak it, and so forth. They made that big mistake. Now, they felt. They had no room to admit their mistakes in public, given the kind of, uh, and, uh, and obviously when you see Senator Cruz out there, you realize there was, wasn't a lot of appetite for people to have a uh, reasonable debate about what's going on. Now, the other thing is, you know, you would not design the American healthcare system. Uh, this is like the Bob Dole chart in 1996. You're not meant to look at it. This, this is what all has to get done to get you eligible. And obviously, anybody who's built a system with all these kind of interconnections, you know this is not going to happen smoothly. You're going to have a lot of snafus along the way where they made a big political mistake is not being honest inside the administration as to how complex this was. And when you think about, as I point out, we, to be on Medicare, you have to be 65. And you know, once you're 65, as I've learned, Dr. Ziegler, you say 65. <laughs> you don't go in and out at 65. 
Income, you may have income in January, not in February, maybe in April you have it again. Income verification is very tough. And how to do income verification to determine subsidies. That's the biggest snafu in this whole thing. They can't figure out the subsidies to get people. So this is going to take a while to fix. There's no way this thing is getting fixed by November 30th. I hope they come clean pretty fast. Now, this is going to take at least a year or more to fix before they get this done. And it therefore has big consequences for what's going to happen. So where are we all? I've tried to suggest to you a couple things. One is going from kind of the FIFA service system to population health is going to be a real challenge for us. I think there's a lot of things Chicago can do, like Penn can do, inside the current system to improve. Again, work on your quality, work on your costs. Experiment a lot, figure out how, especially how to manage certain segments of the population that you feel you have special expertise on. And amongst all of that, all of us, that's going to be inside cancer, inside heart disease, inside high-risk infants, and around inside the neuroscience. I would pick some areas inside that and start experimenting inside of that whether you can provide better value and work out a deal with your local insurers to do some experimentation um, uh, on that. Also, every market's a little different. You cannot generalize totally. So you have to understand, as your leadership does, what's different about Chicago versus Philadelphia versus San Francisco. You know, fortunately, you're, you're not be, uh, Chicago's not driven by big primary care operations. Uh, so you're not, you don't have what you have in California, you have in Minnesota, and you have in Wisconsin where primary care drives it. So you still have the opportunity to work with the specialists inside the region to try to change the care processes. Now, the big part of the, the change that's being driven is by the payment system change in, Ob in Obamacare. But the other things are changing as well, and I listed some of them here. You know, the internet and social media and how people access information about health care, and all the doctors in the audience know, compared to 20 years ago, you know, patients now come to you with stuff they've download it from the internet and say, hey doc, what should I do? As if you, know, you have time to look at 100 pages of stuff that's half good and half bad and figure out what to do. But the patient is increasingly involved, uh, especially with these kind of um, uh, technologies being available. Quality measurement just keeps ratcheting up. You know, CMS is the federal government, Joint Commission, US News. Everybody's doing kind of quality metrics and you can't be inattentive to it. Uh, the professionals themselves, if some of you have heard of the uh, Board of Inter Internal Medicine coming out a year and a half ago of what's called the Choosing Wisely a program to get physicians to take more of a lead and uh, uh, in uh, only doing what's necessary both in terms of both under and over utilization. And as you see in California again where a lot of things come from California, is it likely that payers will channel patients? Now I think that's not a big risk in, in uh, Chicago or Philadelphia. But you certainly see it in, in California, Wisconsin, and so forth. So these kind of things are going to keep moving. In many ways, this can be the most exciting of times uh, of, um, uh, uh, for academic medicine uh, because there's many advantages we have. I remember having been at this for a long time. Every decade, I remember when DRGs came in, everybody thought that's the end of academic medicine. And then the Balanced Budget Act in the 90s and Hillary Care, the Clinton Health Care Program, and regional consolidation and movement towards primary care, they thought that's the end of academic medicine. Now we're being challenged again. Uh, I always felt that our comparative advantage are these programs that we have. It's the fact that you can aggregate under one roof all the towns that you have here, whether it's, on the, uh, whether it's your specialists, such as you know, the, the internists with the surgeons, with the pathologists, and the anesthesia and imaging and so forth, and the, all the various uh, allied uh, therapists, and now the, uh, the various uh, capabilities you have in informatics and uh, policy uh, considerations. The community hospitals cannot replicate that. The insurance companies can't replicate that. So it's the kind of aggregation of human talent that ultimately is the special expertise that the University of Chicago and Penn has. And as long as you keep get, uh, building those teams and bringing them together and keeping them together, I think you'll come out of this decade and the next decade as well as you have out of the other decades. So it's a pleasure to be back and I think Mark and I will take some questions. Uh, Mr. Muller's talk is um, open for questions and comments. Uh, uh, Mr. Mayor's question was about whether things like the affiliations that people have with Mayo and Cleveland. First of all, there's very few national brands in healthcare. Mayo and Cleveland uh, are, are two of them. But even then, that's known inside a room like this. You, the average person on the street uh, may know about Mayo and not much else. Uh, so there are there's most. You know, the, Tip O'Neill always said all politics is local. Essentially, all healthcare is local. Almost all, even, even the Mayo, 80% of their patients come from 100 miles around. 
Cleveland, and it's, uh, it's true of Chicago, it's true of Penn, so it's a very local business. So I think these affiliations, uh, they're attractive if you, if you, if those are your business, it's, it's attractive if you can get a franchise fee from some hospital in Florida or elsewhere. For example, MD Anderson, which is a big cancer center in Houston, just signed up a hospital in, in Camden, New Jersey. So, so it's nice for MD Anderson because uh, uh, it's, uh, you know, they get a million dollar fee, uh, but you know, Camden, uh, has the same demographics as, as Newark. It's one of the poorest areas in the country. It's all Medicaid and uninsured. And the Anderson doctors have given a chance. They want to practice in Scottsdale, Houston, or Camden. They're going to say, I'm going to stay where I am because I can't afford to practice there. So I, a lot of these things, I think, are uh, good franchising moves for the people who are franchising, not good moves for the people who, who get it because it doesn't change the practice, in, whether it's in Florida or elsewhere. Uh, it doesn't change uh, the practice there. Uh, they, they may have access to protocols, but they can have access to protocols through their specialty societies and so forth. So I think basically it's a clever marketing move that a couple of places can make. I don't think it's dramatically going to change healthcare in America. I think the kind of, you know, this is still hardcore emphasis on variation inside your hospital, quality improvement inside your hospital, infection rates, mortality, those kind of things. That's hard work. We should work at it. I think bringing somebody from outside, sometimes I think management sees that, oh, well, I brought the mail in. But it doesn't change anything. Uh, I mean, mayors glad to get their fee. So I'm much more skeptical. Those things are, are fruitful things to do. I mean, if you're a mayor of a Cleveland Clinic, you, you should be glad somebody's willing to pay your marketing fee, but it won't help the local hospital. The question is about the ACOs. Now, the ACOs are very much an integral part of the payment changes that are built into Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act. And now, there's uh, several hundred of them that have been piloting around the country. I think we have to, you know, the uh, University of Chicago is an evidence-based place, just like Penn is. So I, first we have to see what evidence comes out of these ACOs. Uh, the previous demonstrate, the, the big demonstration around the group practice model uh, six, seven years ago uh, showed some modest quality improvement and, and, and cost savings in only one of the ten sites. And they went, uh, the, 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 the big cost savings with the University of Michigan site and they had pretty high utilization, like Philadelphia did to begin with, so they were able to bring the utilization down. I'm pretty skeptical that the results on the ACOs are going to be that positive. Um, part of it is, as any of you who try to manage a population, uh, the ACOs, they, they were a little bit too politically correct on this. So they, they have what is called attribution of ACO. So if you're running an ACO, you don't necessarily know who your patients are. Now, exactly how you manage a population if you don't know who they are is very difficult. It kind of, it, by definition, you can't manage a patient you don't know about. It. They attribute patients to you based on their utilization. So, but you so for example, uh, one of my colleagues that used to be with all of us here, uh, Steve uh, Lipstein, he tells me the ACO they have down at Barnes Jewish in St. Louis, 25% of the patients in the ACO they didn't know about until after the period was over. So I think the current ACO methodology is deeply flawed. That being said, the underlying ACO concept makes a lot of sense. So I think we'll learn from that, and that kind of the ACOs we develop with, uh, within our regional markets can be done differently. But as, as my comment suggests, you know, like we get our patients from 80 miles around, and 80% of our patients come from somebody else, are seen as primary care by somebody else. How, do, how does my medical center manage the care of populations to, to whom we have no IT connectivity, no way of managing that care, we don't know about them before or after. So I think the ACOs have to be done more around the kind of uh, chronic disease population I talked about. So I'm willing to do an ACO around heart failure. I'm willing to do an ACO around heart attacks. I'm willing to do one around strokes. But as I say, here's 100,000 people. If, if, those are, uh, if I said to you here, you're responsible for a population in, in Wisconsin and uh, one down in Indianapolis and a couple of people out in Joliet, you'd say, how the heck do I keep on top of those people? I don't have IT connectivity. I have no way. It's very hard to do that kind of general population management. You can do it. If you're the only game in town, there's no other hospital. It's very hard to do it in a metropolitan area. I think you can do it around clustered populations. And I think the ATO should be based much more around those kind of clustered populations where you can, in fact, say, I'm going to keep in touch with the heart attacks. I'm going to keep in touch with the stroke. I'm going to keep in touch with the breast cancer patients. Rick? Well, as Rick said, about half the states, uh, given the Supreme Court ruling, decided not to expand Medicaid. In fact, that's happening in Pennsylvania at the moment, too. They're not expanding it. Uh, I think that's a real travesty because those populations need access uh, to care. And I heard Scott Walker, who is nominally running for president on Morning Joe this morning, 
saying you can't trust the federal government to fund this. They're getting 100% funding for four years. And uh, it just baffles me why, uh, in fact, the citizens of Wisconsin are paying, and citizens of Pennsylvania are paying for Medicaid expansion in the other 25 states. I've never figured out why they wouldn't do it. And I mean, I, the hypocrisy of, of uh, saying that they're worried that in due time uh, it won't be funded. Now, it's true of all federal programs in due time, they may change. Uh, but the reality is to turn down 100% funding for four years, 90% funding after that just strikes me as very unwise. It's an obviously an ideological statement, not a policy statement. And it denies, uh, you know, there are about 16 million people who are going to come in under that Medicaid expansion. Really? S 16, when, when Obama, that was the estimates by the CB Congressional Budget Office when Obamacare was passed. And with half the states not participating, that number is going to go down uh, uh, quite a bit. So I think it's a, it's a major mistake. And, it will affect, uh, obviously, in, in Pennsylvania and Wisconsin. And, 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 and Texas is obviously the poster child uh, for places that should have people insured with 25% on insurance. So, but uh, this is driven by ideology, not by any kind of evidence as to uh, what's wrong with the system. Right, right, right. Phenomenal talk, and welcome back. We love having you. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to have a corollary to what you said in that you have 80% of your patients from 80 miles away and 80% are from uh, private uh, hospitals or uh, providers. How do you combat the interoperability problems in terms of electronic health records where they may have a different system and now you have to see them for the first time? And for me as a radiologist, how do you image transfer? Has Penn done anything to deal with this? It's very hard. And so obviously, um, you know, we, um, we're an epic shop, so we can use uh, programs. Uh, I'm not getting into epic jargon with you, but you can have epic link in those kind of places where you can read. Uh, we, we do let uh, doctors uh, elsewhere have read-only access to our system. But when they're coming in with information from a uh, hospital outside, images and so forth, with the same problem you have. You know, so many of our doctors want to redo the MRI, want to redo the image. So we have all those challenges that you have as, as well. And that interoperability has advanced in some states. Uh, I don't know where Illinois is. Pennsylvania is and not even close to doing it. Uh, Delaware and some other small states have done a little better at it. But my guess is the big, complex states. Now, to, to be fair, New York has done a pretty good job of this in New York State. Uh, but uh, it's very, it varies very much around the country. And it makes it very hard to do, do that kind of integrated care um, that, uh, that one wants. But what, what, what we do with some outlying hospitals, uh, and you can't do it with that many, is have joint tumor boards and do telemedicine with them as a way of keeping track of some of the more complex acute populations. But you can't do it to a whole population out there. You, you, can't, you can't put telemedicine into hundreds of offices. Uh, you can do it in clusters like a big hospital and so forth. You can do, uh, so uh, that's a big challenge in most parts of the country and will continue to be uh, uh, for the time being. My guess is there has to be some kind of technology breakthroughs you know, to uh, allow that, uh, which is going to happen more uh, from the technology providers, not from the health systems, to, to figure out how to overcome that problem. Hi, Ralph. Welcome back. It's Thank uh, great to see you here. Um, oh, that's, that's hello. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, the question I want to ask you about is the issue of cost transparency. And um, what I'm thinking about is that your institution, um, like the one you left behind, are likely very high cost institutions. And so there are, are two aspects of this that um, keep my mind very active and at work. One is to what extent um, will patients be making their decisions on where they can get the best um, costs for their total hip replacement or their bone density screening or whatever the issue is that they need. And the one that I deal with um, very regularly is how do we teach students and residents about the costs of care when it is completely opaque and impossible to figure out what in fact those costs are. So you've been at this a very long time, and I'm wondering if you could speak to um, the question of how far away are we from real transparency and cost? And um, then secondly, um, how will that transparency, if in fact it um, happens, impact um, patient behaviors and our ability to teach the next generation? Uh, a couple questions there. So first of all, 
We've known for 40 years, going back to the RAND studies, that if you have the patient pay more, it has some effect on some of the behaviors, such as uh, seeing a doctor for you know, their vaccinations and come for primary care visits. So it has an effect there. Uh, when somebody is diagnosed with breast cancer, uh, you know, and they come to the University of Chicago or Pennsylvania, one day in the hospital will blow through any politically feasible deductible there. So if you think about the politics of this, what can you charge a patient for care in, in the politics of America? I'd say it's probably somewhere under $10,000 a year in an insured system, under $10,000 a year. So basically, even with co-pays, deductibles, premiums, and so forth, we're not a society yet that's going to say, I mean, obviously, if you're totally uninsured, then your house gets taken away. Kind of, but an insured program, like Obamacare, or if you're employed by you know, uh, the bank or by the or, or University of Chicago, your deductible and co-payment for acute diseases, you're going to blow through it in first one day. So my answer is, on ambulatory care, on routine care, on colonoscopies and that kind of stuff, you're going to have price sensitivity, which is going to affect demand. On the complex stuff, it has very low price effect, because basically once you've been diagnosed with heart failure, need a transplant, have premature triplets and so forth, uh, in one day you've used up your deductible for the year, and after that you're basically you're covered by insurance. So in some ways we're a little bit more protected from that than a place that's just a primary care place. And the reason that Walmart and CVS compete at the $59 level, that's what people are willing to pay. So I think it has less effect on us. So I don't mean, therefore, we should be complacent about that. Secondly, as I've argued, we're always going to be high cost per unit. So my argument is, as I said in my example around the breast cancer, try to work out deals with insurance companies or depending where you are with employers, as Cleveland Clinic is on knees and hip replacements, and say, give me a whole population or give me a big segment of your population, and I'll sort it out for you. And I'll tell you who you have to spend 100000 on and who you have to spend 1000 on. Because I'll do the genetic and other kind of evaluation that tells you who will respond to the therapy and so forth. I think that's a way of taking our higher unit costs, if we cost three, dollars $4,000 a day, and by basically saying, if we take care of people and evaluate who needs the care and who doesn't need the care, who can benefit, I think that way our higher unit costs can be turned to something that perhaps is an advantage to society by working out those kind of arrangements. Now, those are going to take five, ten years to work out. That's not a panacea tomorrow, but I would really try to figure out how we use our relative advantage in diagnostic skill to that effect. In terms of transparency of prices, um, you can basically get transparency on the easy stuff, you know, medications, uh, scopes, imaging, and so forth. And you'll probably see more, just like people right now, you know, uh, go to eBay and Amazon, and you see it around the country right now in Dallas and places, you know, who will do an MRI for 400 bucks, and people will sign up and do the MRI for 400 bucks. When you're in the middle of cancer therapy, in, 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 or seeing you and your colleagues in, uh, in any of the programs in medicine or surgery, or seeing Dr. Kaplan, you're not, you're not in the middle of you know, Dr. Kaplan's OR and say, well, I want an independent pathologist to come and read this slide for 20 bucks. You know, it's not going to happen. So I think uh, once you're in a course of care, that model of going to the spot market uh, for pricing is not going to work as well in healthcare, but it's much more integrated. And the extent to which we want the model that we teach over the business school, having everything done on a market-based and contractual-based versus the model of integrated care and population health, they compete against each other. So I, I'm very uh, suspicious that you can really have a lot of pri uh, price transparency once somebody's seriously ill. And since this place is going to focus on the 5% of the population, that's 150% of the cost, I still think price transparency is not going to be our biggest issue. What's going to be our issue is bringing our costs down. So the methodologies you can use for your students, residents, and then they, they want, I, mean, I, I would do as much as you can, and obviously you do a lot, given your role in the training program, I would do as much as you can uh, to have the kind of conversations where uh, the RICs and other people of the world kind of talk to your residents and your uh, medical students about what care costs in America. And I think that, I mean, I, I know this, in any curriculum, people have a lot of suggestions, but that's something I would look at. Hey, have you calculated uh, the potential cost to the University of Pennsylvania system of the likely health reform that's going to take place in the next year or two? What they're basically trying to do is, quote unquote, bend the cost curve. So I don't think, by and large, uh, what we get paid is going to go down in any measurable way. Um, I don't think that's me. But, um, I think what is going to happen is we're not going to get the kind of inflationary increases. You know, we were used to getting 5 7% increases over the last decade. 
and that's not going to happen um, uh, anymore. Uh, so I think the big challenge uh, is to figure out how to keep your cost inflation uh, at that one, two, three percent level rather than six, seven percent level. And uh, you know, for example, health, national health care costs the last three years have uh, been going up three, four percent a year, the lowest increase in about 30 years. If you go up two or three percent versus five percent, you know, as you know from your uh, retirement account, it makes a big difference after 10 years. So if, we can keep, if you can keep your cost inflation here at the two, three percent level, rather than the five, seven percent level, that's a big win. And I, I would focus, uh, and I think both, and I think your staff, your doctors, your nurses, all your people feel a lot better. They don't think you're gutting the place, but basically challenge all of them, reduce variation, figure out better care, and by reducing that variation, you can bring the cost down. Last question, Mark Marshall. Marshall. Uh, earlier this week, I was at a meeting where the CEOs of Weill, Cornell, and Beth Israel Deacon said that even if their hospitals still, maybe 20 or 30 percent of their patients that are the really the high tech, high complexity patients that really are unique to <coughs> active medical centers, they said that the majority of centers, including their patients, still is like 70, 80 percent of the patients really are the, the more bread and butter cases that here could be done equally well at, at community hospitals. So in terms of like the viable business model, I mean, you mentioned, well, you could increase the flow of high tech. High well, you know, when you, uh, since uh, Marshall is very good at this kind of stuff, we do kind of what's called case mix adjustment, get rid of, adjust for acuity. Those routine cases in our place aren't that much more expensive than they are in the community hospitals. The community hospitals, uh, they are cheaper than us, but they don't have the same kind of uh, acuity, point one. Secondly, you ha we have to hope that some of the premium pricing that we've been getting for 30 years from Blue Cross, from Medicare, and I spent a lot of time in Washington trying to keep that going, that the premium pricing we get for the complex stuff is also allows us uh, to get a little better pricing on the rest of it. If we really, if those all become commodities, we're all in difficulty. Uh, so uh, I think uh, that requires us to keep educating the people who pay us, whether it's Blue Cross or um, the Congress and so forth, that if you treat us uh, on that 70, 80% of the business as a commodity, you'll stink all the big medical centers in the country, and then you lose all the advantage you get from academic medicine. So I think part of that is a political discussion. So I mean, if we go to that kind of market, we're all in trouble. Uh, so that doesn't mean, therefore, you kind of whistle past the graveyard, but you have to keep figuring out how to make the case uh, to Blue Cross, uh, to CMS, to Congress, that, we're worth, that the, the package of what they get from us is worth it. It doesn't mean that they'll pay us uh, outlandish numbers, but I think, as I've said, if we can figure out how to live at two, three percent increases, I think society will back us. I, I think uh, we're not in a period where we can keep getting seven, eight percent increases. And you know, the, the federal budget on Medicare, you know, the CBO, and even the critics, if they want to be honest about this Her Heritage Foundation, if you start getting one, two percent increases in Medicare and Medicaid over the next ten years, the entitlement budget problem is solved. It's if you project out, it's going up to seven, eight percent you have a big entitlement budget problem. So a lot depends on whether we can dampen the increase by doing the kind of things I suggest around reducing variation, managing uh, the chronic diseases uh, in a much more powerful and insightful way, using the kind of skill sets we have in, in diagnosis as well as interventions to manage this. I think that's, that's a course forward uh, for us. I want to thank you so much for coming. Thank Thanks, you. Brian.